Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's online community forum. I'm Pam Duncan. I am the president and CEO of Metropolitan Development Council. And a little later on, we will be joined by Twina Nobles, president and CEO of the Tacoma Urban League, with whom we are partnering for these uh, very important conversations. Tonight's conversation is the 17th in a series of discussions where we are diving into the different ways that COVID-19 is impacting Tacoma and Pierce County. And as we've all been finding out in this journey, this pandemic journey, there are so many different issues that have been bubbling to the surface in terms of impacts. Tonight, we will have a discussion with our very own Pierce County Auditor Julie Anderson about the steps you can take and how you can encourage others to get registered, vote, and make certain that your vote will be counted in November. Remember, we are here for the duration of the COVID-19 crisis for the community with new conversations that come up every Monday at 5 o'clock p.m. The most important message of everything that we talk about throughout this series of conversations is that there is hope for our community. Our focus is to create space in each meeting to talk about resources and things that we all can be doing to help get us through this pandemic. So before we go any further, we are incorporating something very important as part of our practice. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that this meeting is being conducted on indigenous lands, um, on the indigenous land of the Puyallup people who cared for their ancestral lands before the Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854 removed native peoples to clear way for colonial settlements. It is important as settlers here aspiring to care for immigrants and refugees in this place and to call it home, that we acknowledge and send gratitude to the Puyallup tribe of Indians who continue to be leaders for justice in our community today. Throughout today's conversation, you can submit questions to be addressed by our speakers using the Q&A function in Zoom. We cannot promise that we will have time to consider every question, but we do make every effort to get through the list in our allotted time. And then just as a housekeeping matter and for the security of everyone on this call, everyone's mic has been muted and we are not allowing everyone to show their faces on video. We have also disabled the chat functions. So remember, please submit your questions through the Q&A function to our moderator. And so, I'd like to go ahead and move on and introduce our speaker, Julie Anderson. Julie, thank you so much for joining us this evening. How are you doing this evening? Great. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to connect with the people in your audience. Thank you very much, Pamela. And we are certainly very happy to have you here, Julie. And we are just going to jump right in with the questions and the conversation. Yeah, let's do it. So let's start tonight with a question on the primary election that took place earlier this month. Can you talk about the jump in the percentage of registered voters who participated in the primary election? and offer your thoughts on why more people voted this time around. Well, uh, sure, I, I would, um, it was historic, uh, the leap that we saw. And I'm gonna ask the moderator if he could to uh, pull up an Excel file that um, 
because we're all about numbers and elections. Uh, I think that this graphic image that's about to be shared really uh, speaks volumes about the, um, the turnout. So there's a couple of things, and uh, this, is, this is a snapshot of the primary election, and the blue bars are registered voters in Pierce County. So this is just Pierce County. So the blue bars, you can see that we've been climbing and climbing and climbing in terms of the number of registered voters. And the red bar is the ballots cast in the election. I want you to focus for just a little bit on those two colors. And look at what happened August the 4th, 2020. And then look at that uh, strike line that shows the voter turnout. So we have more registered voters than ever in Pierce County. And we had more ballots returned than ever in an election that we can really find, um, at, mm. least, at least for the last 20 years. And look at that uptick in the amount of turnout. We had been projecting a 35% turnout just based on statistics, a statistical review of voter behavior. And let me tell you, voters are generally pretty predictable and we're really spot on with our projections. This blew us out of the water. And I think that's great. So a minute of celebration to all the people in Pierce County that made this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. So I think that what we saw in the August primary is a good indication of what we will experience in November. In terms of planning purposes, supplies, um, FTEs, work hours, budget, based on this primary, we're projecting a 90% turnout. Now, that, that would be um, an all-time high, um, but that's what we're planning for. You want to you over plan. So let's say it's an 85% turnout. That's huge. And that's a really big deal for Pierce County. People are energized. And you asked me why I thought the turnout um, was so high. I think that, um, you know, I hate to say this, but in some ways the pandemic was a blessing in disguise. Um, it has really created a, a, an environment where people are hunkering down, uh, getting a little old school, actually talking to each other, uh, developing tactics of self-reliance and community support, all the things that civic engagement are really made of. Um, and then we had uh, the Black Lives Matter protest movement and, and counter protests, right? People that are upset that the community is locked down, it, it, it upset counter protesting with Blue Lives Matter, Whatever, people are engaged um, and they've got time on their hands. So they're actually talking with each other and taking responsibility for their community. And I think that's why turnout was so high. Mm -hmm. That's, um, those, you, you made some very insightful points that people are engaged, no matter where you fall, whatever your, uh, personal or political beliefs are that people are paying attention and uh, people are using their right to vote to um, to express their opinions and to um, express their voice to make their voices known yeah they're so, showing up. so um, something interesting that you said I believe you said you're projecting that there will be like a 90 percent turnout we're, we're uh gauging our capacity to accommodate 90 percent it might be 85 percent i hope it's 90 percent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the general election and how does that compare to other general elections well rob's got another spreadsheet for that that i sent him <laughs> okay <laughs> up that same Excel sheet again, Rob, um, and then take it to the general election tab. Poor guy. Poor guy having to do the driving for me. That's right. Click the right. general election. So you can see that there have been some major ups and downs. And this is just isn't Pierce County. This is a rhythm and a turnout that we see all over the United States and in Washington State. 
So there was a big peak, obviously, when um, Barack Obama was elected president. Huge turnout, lots of engagement, and we just kind of went downhill from there. Um, but if you, Rob, click back to the primary again. I think that that big uptick at the end is what we're going to see in November. I think that we're going to see a just a rocket take off in November, and we're ready for it. And I hope we'll talk about that later. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you for that. Um, so one of the things we really want our listeners and the community at large to know is how important it is to get registered and vote. Many people listening to the discussion tonight are already engaged. Yeah. What can we all do to provide easy, simple access to help others get registered to vote? Well, um, people are always surprised when I say this, but about 75% of the voting age population in Pierce County is already registered to vote. So 75%. And that's just voting age population. If you use a voting eligible population, so people that are eligible to vote and of voting age, that goes up closer to 83%. So we've really squeezed a lot of the juice already from voter registration. Doesn't mean that we can't do better, but there will always be some portion of the population that doesn't want to participate, either for religious purposes or privacy, or um, they're, they're just in a state of trauma. Uh, so I think we were doing pretty well on voter registration, but don't give up, please. We can still get people registered. Um, because the Department of Motor Vehicles, the DOL, is only, there was a big story in the Morning News Tribune about this, that um, they're taking new driver's licensing applications by appointment only. That means people that are new to Washington State or they just turned 18 aren't participating in the traditional motor voter program. That's where you get registered to vote whenever you get your state ID or your driver's license, right? The vast majority of voter registrations are through motor voter or online license, online registration. But if you don't have a driver's license in Washington State or a, a, or a uh, Washington State ID card, you can't use that option. So we actually are encouraging people. We, we, move, we did such a big push to move away from paper in, before COVID. And now I'm telling you, maybe go back to paper. Um, so this is a plain old voter registration form. We will mail as many of these out as you want to, or you can go online and download them yourself. So if you are at any kind of in-person, and this is hard, right? Because our traditional civic structures that we count on for democracy are either closed down or only partially open. Our churches, oh my goodness. Um, our civic meetings, our neighborhood council meetings, um, barbecues, those are um, not as prolific as they used to be. But if you're having one of those or you want to walk your neighborhood and leave stuff at doors, leave this voter registration form. It's available in up to 20 different languages. People just need to contact my office. Uh, PierceCountyElections.org, and we will mail you paper copies and free pens. We've got free single-use pens we're giving out that have our website and our phone number, so you don't even have to take the pen back and worry about sanitizing it. So we'll mail you these, we'll mail you forms. Mm -hmm. If you think that there is somebody that either needs to update their registration or get registered for the first time, we're, we're in it. Uh, that was a long answer, and Pamela, Move but on. it was great. That was, and I have so many questions, but I am just like, hey, thumbs up and high five for mailing um, the registration forms along with a single use pen. That is, that specifically states, I am a single use pen and not like the pens that I sometimes get that I find out are just, that's another Nasty, story. nasty. <laughs> just, um, <laughs> Your pens. But um, uh, Julie, can you talk a little bit more? You made a distinction between folks who are voting age, 75 percent, 
And then you talked about voting eligible, which is a smaller, is a subset of voter age, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so what the, was that percentage again? Well, we're closer to 83% for a voting eligible population. So mm -hmm. you, take, uh, you, you, you take the general population and you take away people under 18, people that are in corrections, that are currently serving a sentence for a felony, um, and people that are incapacitated some way by a court order. So those are the some examples. So once you take that away, we're closer to 83%. Um, okay. But we really need to concentrate on that 17%. And here's my big pitch to the audience. Um, even if people are registered to vote, we need people right now to go check their voter registration. Our records are great, but a significant number of people move, change their name, and don't let us know. So you may be registered to vote, but your ballots are going somewhere else and your landlord is, and your ex is not gonna forward them to you, right? Uh, so we need people to go to votewa.gov and check their registration. It's super simple, votewa.gov. You're gonna enter your first name, your last name, and your date of birth, and matching records are gonna come up. You're gonna verify which one is you. Like Julie Anderson's a really common name, so I might have a, a, a matching record. Um, and then you check and see what your mailing address is um, and what your voter registration status is. For example, you might have been inactivated. So if you're a college student that moved um, to go to WSU, let's say, and you didn't tell us, we're sending ballots to your old apartment and they're bouncing back to us because you didn't do a forwarding address. And a bounce back is what's gonna get you into an inactive status. Now that's not purged. You're inactivated, which means we're gonna stop sending. We're gonna stop spending $3 a pop to send mail where you're not at. Um, so if you go to votewa.gov, look up your voter registration status, you will immediately see whether you're active or inactive. You can check the accuracy of your address and your name and update it if you need to, all online, super simple. That's, that's almost more important than the voter registrations of that 17% who may not be wanting to participate. I don't wanna dampen people's enthusiasm, but the bigger problem is registered voters who aren't participating because they're not getting their ballots, not because our records are bad, but because they're not communicating with us and uh, we wanna get them those ballots. So what would you say, what do you estimate is the percent of registered eligible voters who um, are not voting because their ballots are being kicked back to you? Uh, well, we always keep a count of active and inactive voters. Um, and I could uh, go to our website and call that number up, but I'm, I'm gonna say like 5% of people are, um, are not keeping us and their voter registrations okay. up to date. And okay. here's the problem, they, you know, if, if you're in inactive status or there's, your record is incorrect, you can still vote. Those are all the people that are gonna come to us in person on election day for help. And we'll help them, they'll get a ballot and they'll be able to vote. But this is a COVID-19 environment and it's the biggest election in Pierce County's history. It will be, it will be. We will be processing more ballots than in our history. And that's the wrong time for you to come and visit. <laughs> so let's clean it, let's clean up the right. records and okay. let's mail you a ballot so that you can vote like everybody else from home. Okay, right, right. Um, we've got some questions that are coming in. Um, cool. So I'm going to pivot to one of the questions. This is really good. I can't wait to hear this answer. Is What's there any color? I'm going to ask you that at the end. Um, <laughs> making a note. Is there any way to tell when canvassing your neighborhood who is and isn't registered? 
There sure is. Uh, voter registration records are free and available to the public. Uh, you can call our office for more information, 253-798-VOTE, or you can go to votewa.gov um, and you can request voter registration records. Uh, we will uh, provide you probably by CD or a download voter registration records and you can see uh, who in your neighborhood is registered to vote and how frequently they return a ballot or um, that your next door neighbor isn't registered at all. Now, uh, this is a good thing and it's a bad thing. It's, it's a good thing because you can activate people who are inactive. It's a bad thing because um, some of the political parties and campaigns will use it for vote shaming. You remember in the last presidential election, I do because I got all the grief where uh, one of the parties sent out postcards that said, these, these neighbor, uh, uh, your neighbors uh, voted in the last three elections, you didn't vote at all. And they sent it to the entire neighborhood. That's called vote shaming. And um, mm -hmm. it is viewed as a, a motivator to make sure that people will turn in their ballots if they are shamed in front of their neighbors for not participating. Uh, I find that creepy and unhelpful. Uh, and uh, so that's the, that's the bad part of voter registration records being available, but the good part is you can help people who are unregistered. Yeah, well, that was, um... I can see pros and cons to both sides. I can, you know, I immediately think about folks who want um, to, you know, keep their information confidential whether they vote or not. Um, so there's that side. And then for those with honest and positive intentions to promote voter registration and participating in the process, that yeah. it's it's uh, public, it's public information. So thank you for yes. that. And remember folks, if you don't remember anything else, votewa.gov. So another question that has popped up and was also a question that I have um, already uh, prepared um, really are what are the biggest opportunities to get more people registered and of course we're talking about this within the current environment and physical distancing and everything but what comes to mind for you Julie? Well, online voter registration, Washington state was the first state in the United States to have online registration. So votewa.gov, if you've got a Washington state driver's license or a Washington state ID, you can just hop on there and self-register. Easy peasy, all Julie, by yourself. You, you faded out, I don't, it's my internet connection that's unstable, but could you please repeat that? <laughs> if. If you have a Washington State driver's license or Washington State ID card, visit votewa.gov and you can self-register online. It's optimized for smartphones and tablets, desktops, uh, and it um, is translated into multiple languages. Uh, so go online and register that way. If, for, if you don't have that driver's license or ID card or you don't have a computer, then just call my office, 253-798-VOTE, that's 83-8683, um, and we will mail you a voter registration form in your preferred language and one of these dorky pens. <laughs> Thank you for that. I am very excited about the opportunity, uh, personally, and for MDC to promote voter registration. I understand how important it is for people to participate. Tell me about what that is that you're holding up. Okay, uh, this is a postcard, but we, we didn't uh, format it for at mailing because very few people mail anymore. But we've got thousands and thousands of these in time for the general election. This is everything that a voter or a non-voter needs to know about being prepared for November. 
Um, and we would be happy to mail hundreds of thousands of these to any organization that would distribute them. Uh, we're working with Emergency Food Network, who's gonna put them in um, uh, food bags and deliver to their customers. We're working through K through 12. Um, libraries are gonna be popping them into books for their curbside book checkout. There's a lots of ways to distribute these in COVID, and it's everything that a voter needs to know to make sure that they're, um, thank wow, thank you very much, Rob, um, to make sure that their vote gets counted and they, they know what to do to prepare for um, election day. You'll notice up in uh, the corner there, we have drive-through services. Um, it is super dangerous to be crowding people into a lobby and having them stand in line uh, at this time. So we're serving voters through a drive through We did this in the primary. It was very successful. We served um, about 700 people without them ever getting out of their cars, mm -hmm. an average wait time of five minutes, and they were either able to register for the first time and get a ballot, or they were able to get a replacement ballot because they lost their ballot. Either way, in and out without leaving your car, um, and it was very successful. Now, we, 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 we're not encouraging people to go to the drive-through, but if you need that last minute assistance, we're gonna be there for you for three solid days. Um, we'd rather that you check your voter registration now correct any errors, get registered to vote so we can mail you a ballot 18 days in advance and have you vote from home, which is the very safest way to vote. And now I bet you have all sorts of pesky postal questions for me. Oh, you know it. You Hey, you must be a mind reader because I was going to say, speaking of the U.S. Postal Service, <laughs> One of the topics that really caused us to schedule this conversation was the flurry of news and concern last week about changes at the U.S. Postal Service, including the news about mail sorting machines being disassembled here in Tacoma. Yeah. So do you have any concerns and advice for people when it comes time to mail their ballots in? Uh, I do not have concerns, and I will make a point of mailing my personal ballot in using the U.S. Postal Service. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, the, the delivery times have never changed and were not proposed to be changed. So the amount of time it takes to mail a nonprofit bulk rate envelope is the same as it ever was. There's no change to that delivery time. There's no change to the first class time. Um, and that was never the case in Washington state. Um, the mail sorter debacle, I'll just go ahead and call it a debacle. Um, for years, we have been told by the US Postal Service that the high-speed mail sorter at the Evergreen Station, which is by the Tacoma Mall next to our office, was going to be um, consolidated with Seattle operations. So we've been waiting for three years for that to happen. Every year that it doesn't happen, we're like, oh, good. Very convenient for us to literally drive an election van across the street and pick up mail and bring it back. Um, but it finally happened. And unfortunately, it happened during this very controversial, highly politicized changes in the US mail service. Um, now, since then, you know that Postmaster uh, General DeJoy has uh, countermanded uh, his changes. So there, the high-speed mail sorter that was decommissioned at the Evergreen Station is now back in commission. So there was only a week of time that Pierce County mail was going to King County for processing. And it was after the August election. So a very short amount of time. And even if that had stuck and we were having to live with uh, that in the November election, it wouldn't have impacted voters. It would have impacted us somewhat because the US Postal Service, when they pick up ballots from those blue boxes or your homes, the day they pick them up is the day that they date stamp them. And we're a postage stamp, we're a date stamp state. 
We're not like Oregon or other states where your ballot has to be in our physical custody by election day. In Washington right. state, your, your ballot only needs to be canceled with the date of election day or earlier. So even if um, they were picking up from a blue box at 3 p.m. on November the 3rd, but then having to ship it to Seattle for sorting and redistribution, it would still get the November 3rd cancellation stamp on it. But you don't need to worry about that anymore because the high speed sorter is back in deployment at the, it's, it's business as usual in Pierce County. Um, and even if it hadn't been, you would have been fine. So I want to ask a question. I want to go back to something you stated and address something that I know um, has also become a political issue. You mentioned about folks who show up at the last minute, hey, I lost my ballot and I need another ballot. How do you um, ascertain that they aren't casting their ballot twice? Oh, great question. That goes to election security. Because we now have a uh, centralized election management and voter registration system in Washington state that went live in 2019, and, it, and it's a great thing. That means that I now have nearly real-time visibility about what's happening in King County or Yakima County. So if um, some um, person decides to be mischievous and go up and down the I-5 corridor and stopping at every elections office asking for a replacement ballot, um, I'm going to be able to see that um, they are a registered Clark County voter and that they've been issued a ballot um, already. At which point we would ask, are you changing your voter registration? And they would say, yes, ma'am. We would change their registration. The ballot issued in Clark County would be canceled. They would become a Pierce County voter. They would be issued a ballot and so on. The point being that only one ballot per voter is counted. They can get issued tons of ballots up and down, but they can only be a voter in one place. And if they return a voted ballot, that automatically suspends um, and eventually cancels any other ballot that they might have sent in and they're gonna get um, investigated. Okay, okay. So if they are just within a county and they have already submitted their ballot and then they say, hey, I'm in Pierce County, I received it, but I lost it, I need another one. And they, you know, so they're, that's fraud, I guess. If, I if know, you've already, well, so, you know, accidents happen. We don't like to call things fraud and Till we've done an investigation because um, 18 days is a long time to have a ballot and you would be amazed Pamela the number of people that get a ballot vote it and mail it and then they call us two weeks later and say I never got a ballot because they don't remember that they, okay. I swear I yeah, swear I believe that it I believe it yeah um, it's a long time yeah it's, it's a long time to have a ballot and then you have to go and drop it off at the um, drop off box the day of me. Oh, no. Oh, are you one of them? Oh, Pamela. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, you're killing me. You're killing me. So just a stat, you know, just to, I guess, to show that you're in good company. I am in is, good company. Um, so 60% so, uh, of the ballots we received in August came through a Dropbox. Mm -hmm. Yay. They're nice uh, folks. Yeah, that, yeah, that's awesome. No, we love we love people that use our drop boxes. That's awesome. Um, but uh, sixty percent came by Dropbox. Eighty percent of those came in forty eight hours. What do you mean? Uh, I mean that um, everybody waited until the last minute oh, to deposit it in a drop box. Mm -hmm. Eighty percent of Dropbox users waited until the last forty eight hours. Mm -hmm. um, we can hardly drive fast enough through Pierce County to the 47 drop boxes to keep up with that. Just that you know, I mean, we can, we, we do whatever it takes. It's safe to use it. Um, mm. And if you want to late, wait until the last minute, that's great. But I would say that if there isn't a reason for waiting until the last minute, we sure would appreciate it if you would vote as soon as you're comfortable doing it. 
uh, because it takes stress off of the election system. When we okay. get a yeah, when we get a tsunami of ballots like that at the last minute, it creates this choke point. It's like the the difference between a python swallowing a golf ball and swallowing a pot belly pig, and the pig hurts. It hurts. Don't wait. I'm going to ask that python what he thinks. So, but that was a um, a great metaphor, and that was very. Um, that was very informative for all of us who wait till the last minute to know that. Um, I mean, the important thing is that you're voting. Mm -hmm. And so if your jam is to wait until election day, jam on. Uh, but if you, <laughs> if, you, if you really feel confident in your, the choices and you've already made up your mind, we sure would appreciate an early vote. And um, you're organized, I know, uh, so you're not going to lose your ballot while it's hanging around your house for 18 days. But a lot of people that wait until the last minute, wait until the last minute and then go look for their ballot and find out that their teenage son recycled it or they can't find it. And then that ends up being a trip into our office. And that is problematic. Yeah, but, you're or sure. but you're organized. Yes, I am. Thank you for that. Um, so... I, I think I want to go to, since we're talking about the um, going to the drop boxes, how widespread are they and what is the easiest way to find one in your neighborhood? All right. I am glad that you asked. I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see that, you guys? You are like the most prepared panelist in the history of straight talk. Yeah, right. Uh, so this is PierceCountyElections.org, our home page, and we've tried to make it really easy to navigate. Register to vote, update my address, update my signature. Um, and this, hang on just a second, wait for it, wait for it. Uh, oh, by the way, we're still hiring. I was going to ask. Love it. They rearranged, they rearranged the links for me. Hang on. Where's the, oh, oh, return my ballot. Dropbox. And when the election comes on, uh, when, when we start mailing ballots, the, the find a ballot Dropbox will be at the very top of that queue. So you won't have to look for it the way I just did. We seasonally adjust our, um, so you can see that these are Google Maps and let's say that that is a good drop box for me because I live in Lakewood and I'm at Trader Joe's, I don't know, doing some grocery shopping, want to return my ballot. Uh, I'm just going to uh, get turn by turn directions from where I happen to be. Uh, so we've got 47 drop boxes and um, they are pretty darned easy to find. That's um, great. And you saw that we had a picture of every drop box, so you can actually find it in the parking lot or find what it's located next to, because they aren't um, necessarily street addresses. Right, right. And, and those are open 18 days, the entire 18 days, 24 hours a day. So it doesn't matter if you work a graveyard shift or if you're dropping your kids off to, I don't know, something that you used to do before COVID, you can find a Dropbox on your way. And those are secured? Yes, ma'am. Yep, absolutely. Um, nope. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, only two people at a time go to retrieve ballots from those drop boxes. Um, we've got a keying system that's really unique. Uh, every time they pick up ballots, they um, oath and seal them. So, and they, we also have a very complex um, uh, mobile app that we require our teams to use where they approach a Dropbox and they'll take a, a iPhone picture of the seal that's on the outer door and then they'll break the seal They'll take evidence to make sure that it wasn't tampered with, because these are tamper evidence seals. They'll unlock it. They'll um, take the ballots and put them in boxes and seal the boxes. 
and they'll seal them again with tamper evidence seals. They'll take a picture of the number of boxes they're removing from that ballot box. They'll close it up again, reseal it, take a picture of that seal. And by the way, they'll also take a picture inside the drop box to make sure no ballot was left behind. All of those pictures I just talked about and the oaths and the seals are uploaded from the phone into a reporting system. And by the way, the reporting system also is GPS tracking. So when our teams are out uh, doing drop boxes, we can see them real time on a GPS monitor to make sure they didn't stop off at the 7-Eleven for a hot dog um, or anything like that, and that they're uh, adhering to a predetermined route, that they're making good time and that they're taking those pictures to verify what they're retrieving and blah, 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 blah. So very secure. That was amazing. And I lost track of take a picture, seal, yeah. take a picture again, put it in a box, put it in another box, tamper resistant or, yeah. wow, that was, um, okay. You have a lot of steps in place. A lot of accountability. Um, we treat ballots like um, criminal evidence, where chain of custody is incredibly important. So that's really how we treat ballots, like criminal evidence. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is so interesting. Um, we have, in addition to the folks who are live watching via Zoom, we are also live on Facebook. So we're pretty, um, we have a pretty wide distribution here. Good. And I, um, I'm aware that I have some friends and family from across the country who are watching on Facebook. And so um, they um, will probably find this interesting as well. Here's another question that has popped up. Um, and it is, what is the worst case of voter fraud that you've ever seen? Um, well, that would have to be the federal election of 2016. Um, I, I honestly, uh, we don't have, um, we don't, we don't have, uh, really any voter fraud that I'm aware of in Pierce County. We do have people who have, um, made mistakes, um, that have been investigated for voter fraud. Um, who corrected the situation and weren't necessarily prosecuted. Uh, a classic example is a college student at UPS um, who came from Arizona mm -hmm. and they were registered in, Ar no, Colorado. That's another vote by mail state. So they lived in Colorado and a ballot came to their parents' house. Parents forwarded it to them here in Tacoma, Washington. The student in the meantime also registered in Tacoma, Washington, got a ballot and they voted both ballots. Uh, now the student, uh, instead of calling us for advice, um, asked their roommate for advice. And the roommate said, it's not illegal as long as you don't for the, uh, vote for the same office twice. So vote for mayor on this ballot and vote for Senate on this ballot, and that's not double voting. <laughs> and of course, that, that isn't allowed, and that's not okay. You, sh you should never be registered in two places at once, and you absolutely can't vote two ballots. And so those are the kinds of mistakes that we see, and um, we have law enforcement officers investigate those after we do preliminary investigations, and then it goes to the prosecutor's mm -hmm. office. And, uh, in my time, uh, the prosecutor's office has never charged anybody with voter fraud because it's been determined that it was a genuine accident or a mistake. And the definition of fraud is that you're um, intentionally committing a, a mm -hmm. deceit and a, and a crime. And these people, well, they peed their pants a little bit. They, they were scared. It was an accident. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Um, going back to the drop boxes, um, is there a, do you have a um, expectation of how many boxes you would have in the county? Um, is there a certain ratio to a neighborhood? How many can you have? Are you looking to add? 
uh, so we have 47 boxes and until 2017, I was able to use my own good common sense uh, on where to place ballot at boxes. In 2017, the state legislature decided that they knew more about local communities than local election officials. And so they passed a law requiring very specific places for ballot drop boxes. Um, the rule of thumb is one ballot drop box for every 15,000 active registered voters. And Pierce County exceeds that uh, uh, by very much. Um, and we had instituted a um, program where we placed based on uh, equity indexes. So looking at um, underserved communities where there may be transportation problems, poverty, et cetera. Uh, but the legislature said, no, you're gonna place them in these specific locations. And so we spent the last two years placing them in those specific locations, whether they needed them or not, um, which is, uh, been unfortunate, but uh, Pierce County has a great ballot drop box program in the county. If you look back at that map I showed you, it's it's pretty well saturated. It feels good. Mm -hmm. So you're comfortable you, that there are enough? Yes, very much so. If you change your mind, we have property that is owned by the agency that we can have a drop box in front of but there's a drop box a half a mile away. Those are called mailboxes, Pamela. <laughs> in front of your agency. <laughs> well, the, the conversation will be continued, but uh, yeah. in, all in all seriousness, one of the things I like to educate people on, because everybody would like to see a ballot drop box in, in front of a particular business or in a neighborhood, because they care about their neighbors and they, they want it to be like right there. But uh, every drop box costs about $6,000 to site and place. Um, it takes three months for the lead time. And then um, ongoing maintenance and operations is about $1,500 a year. So don't forget that we all those teams of two and that mobile tracking and stuff, for every drop box, we have to do that. So there is a limit to our um, ability to operate them. Right. Otherwise, otherwise, I would have more just because they're so much fun you know mm -hmm. you take a lot of pride in them and so there's a cost to having them yeah definitely yeah. definitely yeah. that that security isn't for, for free um it, you know and we always try to make sure that they're in the right place that they're well utilized mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but you know something if you're working on equity that doesn't necessarily mean the back ballot drop box is going to get used well i mean we placed one at tillicum based on equity index but it's our lowest performer um wow yeah wow. Uh, but but we're still uh, but we're committed to it because that um awareness will grow over time so we're committed to it mm -hmm. So let's pivot <clears throat> for um, a second and talk about the general um, campaign um, or general election. What's your best guess for when local races will be final? Uh, well, that will be certification because election officials never, um, never tell you it's final until it's certified. Um, and that, hang on just a minute. Um, is basically six, eight, 18 to 21 days after the election. I'm gonna actually look it up so I don't give people wrong information. Okay, for the general election, um, no, I'm gonna do something else. Hang on, hang on, be patient. See, that's what you get for calling me organized, Pamela. I'm just impressed at um, all of the information that you've provided and it's, it's, it's just um, been great. Yeah, so it will be November the 24th that the election is certified for November the 3rd. And then what is it for the national election? Well, um, well, we're going to be certifying uh, the results for president all the way down to um, Pierce County Council, all on the same ballot, 
all certified at the same time. Um, some states will have different uh, certification dates, and I don't have those committed to memory, but basically before Thanksgiving, the election will be done, but um, I want to get everybody, um, um, manage everybody's expectations. I expect lawsuits, lawsuits, lawsuits. So none of us are planning um, Thanksgiving or um, Christmas uh, holidays, so. Wow. That's okay. That's, you, we're, we're up for it. Is that typical? No. So you actually answered a question that I was about to ask in part. Um, if you had one message for voters as the intrigue and tensions build leading up to the November elections, what would you tell them? Um, have confidence and have fun. Gosh darn it, Washington State has hands down the best election laws and systems and employees and voters anywhere in the nation. Um, nothing is changing in this state. We've got a tried and true, highly secure election system. So this is your opportunity to cast a vote with confidence, which means you should have fun doing it. Um, mm -hmm. just, just turn out, celebrate, talk to your neighbors, and know that your vote's gonna be counted. Uh, and then just sit back and know that you did your part. And um, when the dust settles, we're gonna regroup and do it all again and build on everything that we learned. So just have confidence and have fun and, and know that your vote is gonna be counted. Don't turn off the TV for a little while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my advice. I found that that works. That has worked well for me. Um, we've been talking about voter registration and I know this is not your purview. Um, but many people will say, I just don't know who to vote for. I just know to, who I want for president yeah. or governor. I don't know about any of these other things. So can you um, help our listening audience to understand about voter education and uh, places they can go to get that type of information? Sure. Um, I don't know if this is going to work. I'm going to see if I've still got, um, I'm going to see if I've still got the, uh, the voter pamphlet up from this last election. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. We do. So you can see here, again, I'm at PierceCountyElections.org, and when November rolls around, this is going to be right at the top of the queue. You're not going to have to hunt around for it like I did. You can see we've got this cool little flip book, um, and it just reads like a magazine. You can see where those uh, ballot drop boxes are. Oh, yeah, okay. So uh, you can see that TVW and Pierce County TV and uh, Tacoma TV are all gonna have candidate forums and debates. And you can follow, uh, we've got little hyperlinks there. And can you see how that hyperlink turns on whenever I hover over it? Which mm -hmm. means if you access this voter pamphlet online, all you have to do is click there and you can see people fighting on TV, it's great. Uh, uh, but if you, it's printed, you can use this QR code. So that's one way to learn more about candidates because let's face it, I, I don't wanna pick on anybody in particular, but let's face it, these, um, these statements in the voter pamphlet are only partial educational, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is what people want you to know about them, but not necessarily their positions on things. So watch this. Look, we've got phone numbers for these candidates and we've got their email. So you can launch an email right here. Mr. Broadhead, I have no idea what you meant when you said this. Could you please explain more? Uh, so you can actually go shopping for your candidate and interact with them directly. 
I would highly encourage that. I think you can learn a lot about somebody about whether they even respond to your email. Um, and you can also visit their website for more information. So those are two things that I would do. Um, and then in closing, I would say that the League of Women Voters is continuing to have candidate forums online. So check their website regularly. And in fact, this show uh, or MDC or the Human Services Coalition should put on their own candidate forums and uh, stream them widely on Facebook. Those are great ways to get to know people. Love it, love it. Thank you for that. I yeah. love seeing the brochure, the pamphlet online, yeah. because I always carry that with my ballot for when yeah. I have time to go through. And um, one of my very good friends decided to call every candidate for the uh, <laughs> primary and had conversations, interviewed every every candidate. Right on, right yeah. on. So I, I just thought that's a great way to educate yourself as well. Um, so finally, what are your thoughts about election security in 2020 as compared to the issues that came up in the last presidential election? Uh, well, uh, hmm. First of all, Washington state has nothing but paper ballots. There isn't a county left in this state that is using voting machines where you walk up, you cast your vote, and then they take the cartridge and bring it back to the election center and download the results. That's a voting machine. We don't have voting machines in Washington state. Everything is paper-based, absolutely paper-based and brought into a central count. So, that's one of the things that makes our voting system so secure. Uh, it's verifiable. It's easy to audit. Um, the vulnerable part of every state in the United States is the voter registration system, especially in Washington state where it has a public portal because we do online registration and here I am inviting you to please update your records, et cetera. That means that it connects to the internet somehow. So the security around the voter registration is extraordinarily tight and complicated, and I am not gonna tell you how it's secured, because that's how you invite hackers. Mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you that I have a high degree of confidence in it, that it uh, is not breached in any way, and that it's censored. Every county in Washington state is uh, protect, protected, not protected, monitored by an Albert sensor. Raise your hand if you know what an Albert sensor is. Um, it is um, a completely independent uh, server that does nothing but monitor your web traffic. So the people that are visiting that web page I just showed you, the people that are interacting with the voter registration module, it tracks that and, if it's, and it will independently detect if there's like a denial of service attack or somebody's defacing a website, it will detect that. And it's monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week by cybersecurity professionals that aren't us. Uh, it's like a tripwire, it's like a burglar alarm. That's it, it's a burglar alarm. Uh, and all of these Albert sensors are connected and feed into a national network. So if something starts in Chicago and we see a trend, we're ready for it by the time it hits the Pacific Coast and vice versa. And it really helps dog down and prosecute these cyber criminals when they make their attempts. That is just one of a hundred ways that our election system is secure. So I'm highly confident. Now, with one caveat, there's nothing that I can do about misinformation. If, if it's still open season on playing us all for fools on social media, mm -hmm. network news, you name it. Mm -hmm. Rumor mongering, hysteria, all that stuff is out of my control. And that, so when you asked me what's the biggest case of voter fraud I've ever seen, and I said 2016, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about this, the, the type of voter suppression and tilting the odds that has more to do with psychological warfare and misinformation 
than than cybersecurity mm -hmm. in the election cycle. Sure. And that still continues to concern me and it should continue to concern you. And I would just ask everybody to use their good common sense and slow down what they ingest and really be on guard for misinformation and division. Because sometimes even the good guys or who you think are the good guys participate in misinformation. Mm -hmm. The um, hyper, hyper partisanship is a type of misinformation. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so be on guard, use your head. Mm -hmm. That was very good. I said that was my last question, but something popped up and I find it very intriguing. Um, and there actually there's something else. So as I listened to you talk about the ballots and the drop boxes and the mailboxes um, and all of the security that's around ensuring that my voice gets heard it also occurs to me that we really need to treat that ballot like gold. Like Willy Wonka's golden ticket. <laughs> yeah. And because, and it, it made me wonder like, what, what are the things that could be done that would disqualify a ballot? Oh, um, um, thank you for asking that. The number one thing that happens is people don't sign their outer envelope. Um, they don't sign their outer envelope or they don't, um, or the signature doesn't match and they don't respond to us. So you're, you're, or it's too late. I can't tell whether this is mirrored or not, whether people can read it. So your ballot yeah. is always going to come and it's going to tell you on the outside exactly when the deadline is. And election mm -hmm. day, sorry, Pamela, election day isn't the event. Election day is the deadline. Mm -hmm. That's the way I think of it. We have an election period of 18 days. This is the deadline, but it's on here just in case you forget. And then uh, ballots, and then you have to do this. You have to sign this oath. And if you don't sign the oath, uh, this envelope that you mailed back to us or put in a Dropbox will never even be opened. We don't even, pro we don't even open it if it's not signed. And if the signature doesn't match, we're going to send you a letter and we're going to call you and ask you to cure it. And you don't have to come into the election center. It can all be done by paper remotely. Um, and when we ask you for your optional phone number or email, that's why we're asking. We can notify you earlier if you put that down. We never release your phone number or email. If somebody's calling you and harassing you, you know, with those robocalls, it's not because they got the, the phone number from us. It's big data, data matching. So please feel free, and I would encourage you to put your phone number down in case there's any problem. And we give you right up until certification day. Remember, that was like the 24th or something to cure it. So it can be way after election day that you clear this problem up. And at the end of the day, Pierce County rejects only 1% of the ballots, 1%. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. too many, but I tell you what, in a polling place state, I guarantee you that we lose more, way more than 1% of the votes mm -hmm. because people show up late or at the wrong polling location or without photo ID. So a 1% rejection rate is very, very low. Uh, when you compare it with uh, in-person polling place states. Mm -hmm. So what about, you, you mentioned you have to make certain that you meet the deadline, that um, you sign that envelope, that inner envelope. Yeah, that's right? it. But what about on the ballot itself? Um, if you, you know, if somebody selects two individuals for one particular race, that nullifies that, right, that particular race, but does it impact the rest of the ballot? No, good question. You've got that right. So if you vote for two people for 10th Congressional District, so there's going to be two people on your ballot, if you vote for both of them, uh, you've just 
you've just thrown away your vote. That's called an overvote. Um, if you skip the race, it's called an undervote. Um, and you don't have to vote everything on your ballot. If there's three races or people that you really care about and there's 15 items, vote for those three things. Leave the rest blank. We don't care. Those three choices will count. But you've got to make up your mind. You can't vote for everybody. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so just one selection per race. Mm -hmm. Vote on the stuff that you care about. Um, don't use the write-in line unless it, you know that there's a declared write-in candidate. Because if you, if you select write-in and you write in um, Pamela Duncan. I'm not running for anything. So but but, but if, she's not, if she's not a declared candidate, you've just thrown away your vote. Yeah. Yeah. So last question. Yeah. Maybe. What does a typical election day look like for you? This is kind of long. Do you have special things that you do to liven things up to get through the long hours? Um, like a lot of the state legislatures, legislators have fun with their pattern socks. Uh, <laughs> well, I would say we don't need any help livening things up on election day. Um, I, uh, uh, a trip to the restroom is always a treat, um, if I can make time for that. Uh, it, it's, um, it's like preparing for a Broadway musical and you haven't had a chance to rehearse and you're just hoping that all of the plans and the parts and the scripts all come together um, because you don't get to rehearse elections if you think about it. We've got policies, procedures, equipment, and people, but you don't get to put it all together and put it through the grist mill of a 90% turnout until the day. And you don't get any do-overs. So uh, I'd say on election day, we're all running at uh, you know 180 RPM and being flexible, um, being happy, we want our voters to be uh, greeted uh, uh, with happy, enthusiastic faces and with confidence. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there's pizza involved, but mostly it's just literally running around and making sure that all of the teams are getting what they need to be successful and responding to all the things that you couldn't have anticipated. Mm -hmm. The car in the drive through that loses its battery and all of a sudden you've got a backup of 20 and 30 cars. You know, you, you got to be on that. Uh, the, the guy that shows up in um, a, a superhero costume wanting a replacement ballot, um, you just got to respond to all of that stuff. The, the, the drop boxes that... Up. The drop boxes that everybody are sure are overflowing uh, that really aren't, that you've got to run out and, and make sure that it's, it's not full. It, those things have a huge capacity, by the way. If you think a ballot drop box is overflowing, I would just ask you to take a fingernail file or a ruler or a pen and just poke it because chances are a family of five just came through and they just tried to jam five ballots into the thing. They didn't poke it far enough. That doesn't mean it's overflowing. Um, so be a poker. I'd appreciate that. <laughs> it sounds like these are uh, real life things that um, have happened that you can't make up, like farmer's insurance. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> before we go for the night, Julie, where are you finding hope in the world as we continue to navigate through the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and ongoing violence against people of color in our communities? Mm. Uh, on the, well, we're having a moment in this country and in our community and I, I'm looking at pushing through the moment and getting to a place of healing. 
and uh, just really dreaming of being able to embrace people and help people heal um, and getting to that next phase of um, reconciliation and justice. Mm. Um, and uh, taking off a little bit of pressure so we can help heal. Uh, so that's one thing. I will say that I'm uh, very optimistic. You would think that um, our job is hard in elections, but I would just say it's only because you're not in elections. What we get to see every day is um, candidates and voters of every political persuasion telling us that they believe in the security and integrity of the process. You hold a recount and you think that the person that loses is gonna be a sore loser. They walk up to you and they thank you at the end of the recount. They lost by a razor thin margin and they said, well, um, I believe in the process and thank you for making it so clear and trustworthy. Dogs are back home. So uh, the moments like that, um, uh, are the reason that we're able to be so confident and joyful in our work. And uh, as a Pierce County resident, I'm just looking forward to um, getting through this moment and uh, starting to heal with everybody. We're gonna come through this stronger and it's gonna be awesome. We're already in an awesome place, but it's gonna be awesome. Thank you so much, Julie. Our process is in very capable hands, and we so greatly appreciate you. We've got the best voters ever. We do. And we thank you for making the time to be a part of Straight Talk, community conversations about COVID-19. Thank you so much for all of this valuable information that you provided. Remember everyone, go to votewa.gov and make certain that you are registered. If you need to update your signature, your address, whatever it is, I'm just gonna go on it and check it out just to see how user-friendly it is and navigate how easy it is to navigate. And Julie, you didn't tell us your favorite color before we go, which is? Uh, I, I, I was just joking because that's what when I when I talk to middle school kids, that's what they ask me. <laughs> that are my Disney character, and I'm not good. Um, right. But I am, but I am enjoying peaches right now. Okay. The harvest is just lovely. Go go visit your farmers market. Buy some of that produce. It is delicious. That's great to hear because I love to bake and. Peach pies are one of my favorite things, so. Duly noted. Yeah, that's All right. right. All right, hey um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us again this evening. We just had a great conversation with Julie Anderson, our county auditor, and we want to say to everyone, don't forget to vote, don't make certain that you are registered, and then vote. And thank you for joining us this evening. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night.